my name is Sasha Alec, and what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to try and inspire you to take a different view on what DJs and electronic music actually are nowadays. I'd like to show you how DJs are in fact artists um, and how they managed to create an industry which only really rewards its own artists upon record sales. It's something that we need to, as an industry as well, we need to learn to apply and we need to get this DJ's freedom of creativity and apply it to the actual mainstream music industry as well. But first of all, I'd like to show you how DJs actually work just like contemporary visual artists as well in the fine arts world do as well. And then I'd like to show you that how music has been created in the past 50 years is not, very that, not that much different to how DJs work nowadays. And finally, I want to show you that loosening and updating the copyright laws, just like the DJ, and I'll, I'll show you how, um, DJ does, will actually allow a greater amount of music to be produced and then a lot better amount of mu uh, music to be produced. But first of all, let's start by trying to demystify one of the most popular stigmas attached to the DJ. Because to the untrained ear, most, the, most people and, and fans just see DJs as record players and nothing else. But actually there's an artistic skill behind how a DJ actually approaches his set, his mix, his remix of a, an original track. And this is a iconic piece from the 60s, pop art, um, by, the, by an artist called Richard Hamilton. And then as I'll show you next, there's Another iconic piece from the 60s as well, which a lot of you will recognize as the cover to the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band by the Beatles. This was actually created by an artist called Sir Peter Blake. And what they do and the way they create this artwork is very similar to what DJs do as well. It's an art form called collage. It's about taking, reproducing, replicating and reordering other people's work in their own format to create their own piece of original work. And now moving on to slightly close to our times, I'd like to show you a piece by a contemporary video artist that you might, you, some of you might know. He's called Christian Markley. And what he does is he takes snippets of films, thousands of films, and he puts them together. Enfin, regarde-moi. Regarde-moi, par ici. Mais enfin, les montres. Tu es sourd ou quoi Tu n'as pas entendu ma question <laughs> Now, what Chris and Markley's done here is he's taking thousands of clips, showing clocks, showing people in films, telling time. And what he's cleverly, very cleverly done is he's rearranged them to actually tell a story. So it's actually, when you, when you watch it in, in the galleries, it's actually at the same time as, as you're watching it. So if it's, if it's 424 on the screen, it's actually 424 in our real lives as well. And it actually creates a narrative structure to how film actually uses time as a component when creating film itself. Now, this piece in particular, last year, got huge recognition across the entire art world amongst critics and journalists. And some critics actually have called it a masterpiece of our own time, a timeless masterpiece of our time. Now, it's interesting that these three artists are seen as artists, as seen as masters within their field, but we don't allow that much tribute to the DJ within the music scene. And I think we ought to, because in my view, the DJ is actually at the vanguard of the contemporary music scene. And it's not something that I, I'm the only one opinionated on it. I think there's a lot of other people in the industry as well, amongst bands, amongst producers, amongst managers and fans that feel the same way. And actually, one band that, in, that felt that way in particular was Radiohead. And last year, when they released their second version to the original um, album Kings of Limbs, 
It was a full LP of remix tracks. And I remember reading an interview with Tom York, the lead singer of Radiohead, last year. And there was a few things that really struck me, and I completely agree with him as well. And the journalist had asked him why he felt that he needed to allow other artists to take his work and remix it. But what's really interesting is that Tom York actually responded by saying that he didn't see his music as a finished product. It wasn't set in stone, which is actually something that really resonates with the open philosophy that our open society actually built on. But then he went into another part of the component as well, which is the fact that his love for the remix culture was actually coming out of the clubbing industry and the clubbing world. And it was interesting because it's true that, I mean, that, that remixing culture is healthy for music, but what is the actual reason and how come it's actually coming out of the clubbing industry? And how has a movement, a musical movement, which only a couple of years ago was seen as an underground movement, all of a sudden influencing mainstream bands and acts of the, of the caliber of like Rihanna or the Adele's of our world and the pop world? And why do so many bands feel that their best attempt to actually express themselves creatively sometimes is going down the electronic music route? Now, my research actually led me back about 300 years ago to what, something, what, something which is actually called the Statute of Anne, and that was actually the first sign of a copyright law. We now call it copyright law. And what I started reading in the British law, then I started reading the American law as well. And I came across a really interesting quote in the American Constitution, which actually states that the copyright law was actually devised to promote the progress of science and useful arts. And it's one of those quotes that I think in the industry and as fans we've actually forgotten about. And it's something that we should be holding truer than ever before. We live in a post-authentic society which is actually dictated by the free flow of information. And in a way, what the French cell philosophers um, Roland Barthes was calling the death of the author in the in 1970s is actually what was happening in the 80s with hip-hop where musicians, artists, consumers become only refraction points to the world that surrounds them and this was definitely like definitely definitely clear in the hip-hop world because there was these beats that everyone was using at the beginning and we had I'm just gonna play you some um, and we had beats like the Amen Break that you might recognize. And we had the Impeach the President Break. And we also had the um, James, James Brown's Funky Drummer Beat as well. Um, but it's interesting because that Impeach the President break, um, beat is something that most of us in the room and hopefully fans back at home will, will recognize as being the backbone to hip-hop music. Um, and it's interesting because what rap music it really is, is actually rap over music. It's not really a style of music. It was back then, you, artists used to, and DJs used to put together tens of samples to create one track on which, over which they actually were rapping over. And what really allowed this movement to be created was actually the turntable and the DJ himself. This movement then inspired other artists across the Midwest America, in Chicago and Detroit, creating house and then eventually techno as well. And these movements eventually then spawned new genres across Europe. And nowadays we've got plenty of them. We've got dubstep, we've got breakbeat, and we've got drum bass, and so many more. But what's interesting is that whilst the electronic music world is actually continuing to progress and creating new work, creating new artists and creating new genres, the hip-hop world kind of came to a stall. And it was around the beginning of the 90s. And according to Public Enemy, in the beginning of the 90s, the record industry realized that there was a profit to be made out of hip-hop. And most rap artists were actually signed to these record labels. And the record labels themselves realized by that, that selling records was actually gonna achieve them greater success. But what lawyers at these record labels realized was something even worse, which was they realized they could start suing each other because these hip hop artists were actually sampling each other's material and material from previous musicians themselves. 
And this actually created a stall in the actual process. And I remember reading an interview with Public Enemy, and they had to actually change the way they were producing their records as well from then onwards. But this wasn't actually happening just in hip hop. It was actually affecting the rock and pop world as well. And as you can see on the screen, I want to bring up a track that I hope most of you actually recognize, which is Bittersweet Symphony by The Verve. And what happened with, with, with The Verve was that Richard Ashcroft had written the original lyrics for the song, arranged the original violin strings, and arranged the original music for the actual track itself. But initially, he had inspired himself from a 1966 track by the Rolling Stones called The Last Time. Now, when they released this track, The Verve were an unknown band, recently signed, about to release their first single. And so, when, they, when Richard Ashcroft had to actually agree to release this, the track with his record label, he had to contact a AKBCO Records in New York, which at the time was a major record label, which actually owned the rights to all the material of the Rolling Stones prior to 1971. And what happened then was that the AKBCO Records, not feeling intimidated by this young band, decided to let go of this and decided that 50% of the profits would have gone to their own record label and 50% would have gone to the actual artist himself. But then the track became the hit that we now all know, the 90s, one of the 90s tracks. And what happened then was that AKBCO Records decided to pull out its corporate lawyers and push the band into giving up full rights for profits and credits of the track. So the band actually made no money whatsoever from this track itself. That same track then was used in three different adver adverts that same year, Nike, Opel and Vauxhall, without any of the two bands' permission. But it was interesting when they asked Richard Ashcroft how he had come up with the track himse himself, he actually referenced old school hip hop. And I quote, he said, I took the track and twisted it. I took it and used my own imagination, just like what, what old school hip hop producers were actually doing in the early 80s. But who really summed up the entire of this dispute was actually Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones, who never even saw a penny as well, but even though Bittersweet Symphony is actually credited to him now. And he actually just said, you know, this is nothing about music, and I quote, this is just some serious lawyer shit. Now, everyone working in, this, in the music industry nowadays realized to a certain extent that limiting copying is just a doom exercise from the beginning. We've got something like the internet which we cannot have full control over. And instead of having an industry that promotes healthy, com a healthy competition amongst bands and amongst creatives, nowadays we have the exact opposite. The industry is actually using this old-fashioned copyright law to their own advantage, and they're actually hindering the creative process of a lot of artists across, across the music scene. And it dictates that only the financially successful sample made music can actually be produced. And if that were the case back in the 80s, albums such as Public Enemies, It Takes Some Millions to Hold Us Back, which is one of the iconic hip hop albums of that time, would have never actually been produced. But we can take it a step further and we could say that tracks like Badlands by Bruce Springsteen, who actually originally took inspiration from an Animals track in the 60s, would have never actually been produced. Tracks like Michael Jackson's Billie Jean, who inspired himself from a Hole and Oates track, would have actually never been produced. But also, the last time by the Rolling Stones, who eventually inspired Richard Ashcroft to create the Bittersweet Symphony, would have actually been produced because the Rolling Stones inspired themselves on a track in 19, produced in 1955 by a gospel quartet called the Staple Sisters. And throughout these 20 years of dispute across the music industry, DJs have been steadily rising, creating more genres, creating new music, creating more fan bases and creating an industry which actually doesn't rely on record sales. So they've actually managed to avoid corporate lawyers and therefore creating what is music at its truest form. But what's incredibly interesting for the industry as well, that they should take note on how this has been produced, is the fact that the music industry last year was actually quoted to be worth over 2.5 billion pounds worldwide. And there's a lot to be learned, especially on a more commercial level of the industry, on how this electronic music dance scene has actually come about. But let's just have a minute to, th to think about the incredible amount of music that could have actually spawned in the past 20 years in the pop and rock world if we didn't have this red tape system which actually is hindering and actually suffocating the artists at the core within 
popular mainstream music as well. Because whether or not we like it, there's, it's, it's, there's, there's some truth to the fact that music nowadays has become some, somewhat prosaic and the industry doesn't actually know where its future is going to go. You know, illegal downloading and people are not buying records anymore. But I think the actual issue runs at a deeper level. And when I say this, it's, I, think, I think you'll agree with me. It's because there's a di direct correlation between the progress in the arts and the progress of society itself. And if art is our cultural reflection, then I believe music is our social reflection. Let's not forget that this, the age of the Enlightenment actually brought us Bach and Mozart. And the 60s might have brought us the Rolling Stones and the Beatles, but they also, they also brought us the Equal Rights Movement. The 70s brought us glam, rock and disco, but they also brought us the sexual revolution. The 80s brought us hip hop and punk, but they also brought us the class wars. And nowadays, in an, in an era of information overload, we depend on these artists to create work and music, which actually creates a narrative and a thread throughout this ocean of information that we might not understand and comprehend. We depend on these artists and musicians to create music, which actually resonates to, the, to, the, to our primordial instincts as well. As I've said numerous times today, we need to adjust our copyright laws in order to allow a greater freedom of expression for all creatives in the music industry. And a greater flow of information and collaboration will eventually, just like the music dance scene, eventually spawn into a greater industry for the music um, world as well. But what's really important, I think, is that the copyright laws, which haven't been updated in 300 years, need to be updated to the 21st century, not just for the good of the music industry itself, but for the, for the progress of our society. Thank you.